great. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, my name is Nadine, and I live in uh, I live near Silverton in the Arrow and Slocan Lakes region. Um, I'm actually calling in from Nelson today because, uh, yes, as Amber said, we have uh, you guys have better internet down here. <laughs> um, so thanks very much for coming. And I know most of you are joining this workshop because you also live, work, and recreate in this same region. And I, I do want to acknowledge that we are in the traditional territories of the Silk Okanagan, the Tunaha, Sequetmic, and Sinaixt peoples. And we live in some of the most amazing mountains here, where I think, as many of you know, we have pretty much some of the best snow in the world. And what's really neat is that we share these mountain slopes and these alpine environments with some pretty special wild animals like mountain caribou and wolverine, which we are going to learn more about and talk about tonight. So I work with y to y Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative, and we're a nonprofit charity with a mission to protect and connect habitat so people and nature can thrive. And my colleague Candice Patiki is also here this evening, and she's a program director um, for BC and Yukon. And um, if you haven't heard of y to y before, we've actually, the organization's been around, the idea and the organization's been around for about 25 years. Um, we're a science-based organiza organization and we work with a variety of partners. We work with government and post-secondary institutions, researchers, other nonprofits, recreation groups, hunters, trappers, ranchers, um, businesses, uh, First Nations, and others. Um, we work with a wide variety of organizations organizations who share in this idea of um, connecting and protecting habitats so people and nature can thrive. And these wildlife workshops are being offered in partnership with Powgals and the Alpine Club of Canada Columbia Mountain section. And we have um, Emily here with Powgals and I think she is going to uh, just say a little a few words. Hi, hi, my name's Emily. I'm representing Powgals. Um, uh, we were an organization of women bringing workshops, clinics, and community events to the Kootenays. We focus on education and supporting women through their careers in backcountry sports or just enjoying the sport in general. Um, we are able, we were able to support this event on, uh, through our second annual film festival last year, um, the Second Hand Soak. Um, we are passionate about enriching our community and supporting um, events such as this and we felt like we wanted to take a conservation focus for the year. Um, if you'd like to learn more about us as an organization, you can see our website at powgals.ca, powgals on Instagram and Facebook, and I hope you enjoy the workshop and thanks for participating. Great, thank you. And Carla Kuharik is also with us. And she is the founder and chair of the Alpine Club of Canada Columbia Mountain section, which um, was established actually as the 24th Alpine Club of Canada national section in 2018. And the Columbia Mountain section fosters opportunities to share in the abundance of outdoor activities that Revelstoke, Nacusp, and the surrounding communities and mountains have to offer. Uh, the group works to help educate and promote safety in the mountains through courses, mentorship, trip leading, personal development, and um, providing opportunities to gain the skills needed to travel safely with the group. Environmental stewardship, awareness, and conservation are goals of the Columbia Mountain section. And we'd really want to thank Powell Gals and the Alpine Club of Canada, as well as the Columbia Basin Trust for their uh, support and their, their financial support of this project. And these workshops were motivated by the many inquiries that we are all getting about how to be responsible winter backcountry recreationists. And so it's really exciting tonight. Um, we have backcountry skiers and snowboarders, Nordic skiers, heli skiers, snowmobilers, snowshoers, um, as well as a few people from outside the region who are curious about how people and wild animals can be in the backcountry together. So our flow of activities tonight includes a presentation from Doris and Andrea, who, I'll, who I will introduce, but you can see on the screen, uh, Wolverine researchers based in Nelson. Um, we also have a presentation from Aaron Reed, and he's a wildlife biologist working with the province also based in Nelson. We do have lots of time for questions, um, and we're also gonna have some time to share our own wildlife stories and experiences. And just before we 
start officially, I wanted to give just a couple of Zoom tips. Um, so if you haven't been on these meetings, online meetings before, congratulations. <laughs> I heard, Emily, this is your first. That's pretty awesome. I know I'm on them a lot and probably a lot of us are right now. But just as a, uh, as a reminder, we, we do ask and we'd love to see uh, your faces. So if you can share your video, if you have good internet, um, it'd be great if you did share your video. I know a lot of people are um, hiding their video right now, um, but we do ask that you um, leave your, do not leave your audio on. So unless you're talking, please keep yourself muted and just make sure that everyone um, can hear the presentation or whoever is talking. Hi, great, thank you. So we're gonna start with Doris and Andrea and the elusive Wolverine. So Doris Hausleitner is a wildlife biologist who specializes in rare and endangered species. Uh, she studied sweet creatures like western toads and screech owls before getting mixed up in the messy world of the wolverine. She is an ecology instructor at Falkirk College, a Google farmer, and also a mother in her other life. And Andrea and Doris work quite closely together. Andrea Cartello is a professional biologist with 20 years of experience tracking large and medium-sized carnivores. And she's been studying wolverines since 2012. And uh, she's told me that she wishes she could travel in the mountains as quickly and effortlessly as they do. And Andrea is really excited to be collaborating with Doris as well as Miriam Barueto out of Golden who is also joining us here tonight and will be presenting for the North Columbia region uh, next week. Um, but they're, all three of them are working together to find wolverine dens in the Columbia Basin. So welcome and uh, take it away, Doris and Andrea. Great, thanks. I'm just going to share my screen here. It's so great to see so many nice faces on a, a November evening. So thank you for coming out and joining us. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Wolverine. Andrea and I are going to share this presentation, so I'll, I'll do the first part, talking a little bit about the biology of the Wolverine and why they're important. And Andrea will tell you a little bit about how to identify them. So Wolverine are a species at risk. They're blue listed in the province and they're considered a species of special concern federally. They're really wide ranging animals. So one male wolverine can cover a home range of about 1500 square kilometers. And they are quite, they come on quite low densities on the landscape. So there's only, in our area, there's only about two wolverine per thousand square kilometers. And to put that in perspective, if you're a bear biologist, you start worrying when there's 20 bears per thousand square kilometers. So they're quite rare. Because they travel at such, it's such large magnitudes, big distances, they're a really great indicator of mountain ecosystem health. And they make us manage at a landscape scale. And when we manage at that scale, a lot of other species fall um, under the umbrella. The wolverine dens in snow in winter, and we'll talk about that a lot today. Uh, but because of this, and because of the fact that they are one of the only animals that travel in the Alpine in winter, um, they're really sensitive to climate change. They're important uh, culturally. The Tanaha, the, the Tanaha call them the Hetzpo, and they feature quite significantly in their creation story. And the Silix Nation refer to them as Quechemin. And the mountain recreationalists really like to uh, be in awe of this animal. Andrew and I started Wolverine research in 2012. And the big, the, it was, it's kind of funny to boil all our research down into one slide, but the big um, story that we got there was that Wolverines are at low densities and they require areas with, um, with few roads, areas with spring snow cover, so persistent spring north facing slopes, and they need food. And so this little guy in the top corner is a hoary marmot and uh, marmot is, is the number one sort of indicator of wolverine in winter. So after 
after we did this study, we thought of a few things. One is that that denning wolverine um, happens in winter. So they den from mid-February to mid-May. And they have very low reproductive rates. They don't start reproducing until they're about three years old. And at that time, they have only one or two kits per year. And they may only have um, offspring every other year. And so the reproductive rate is very, very low. They return to the same denning areas. And this may be the same female returning to the same denning area, but it also might be her offspring. And so these denning areas are proving to be very important. And as I said earlier, in winter, they're found in roadless areas with food and with food supply, um, specifically marmots in our area. And when we knew, once we figured out all these pieces, we realized that in order to protect wolverines, we could focus in on these reproductive areas and have the biggest conservation buck. If we could just protect small areas where wolverines are denning, um, then we'll probably have persistent uh, wolverine populations. And so to do this, we started a, a drones and dens project. And it was a combination of habitat modeling and um, citizen science, and then using that in order to fly specific areas. And the citizen science piece, I can't stress enough, has been so important. We've had a tremendous amount of uh, buy-in from recreationalists and public pe um, people that are out in the in the winter and um, all the den sites that we know to date have come from citizen science. And so the objectives today are for us to be able to recognize and avoid wolverine denning areas. So I'm going to show you a couple of slides here and these are these are just to give you an idea of where you might find a wolverine den. Um, so this, this first slide shows sort of a typical area where you can see there's quite steep terrain. Um, the, the dens tend to be near tree line on north facing slopes and in sort of these roadless quiet drainages. Um, dens are also typically in our area have been associated with large boulders. So uh, these are talus slopes and the boulders are big, like they're two by six by four meters. So big chunks and the dens are underneath those in snow holes. And even though they're in this very steep terrain, um, the den site itself is usually at the toe of the slope in sort of a moderate terrain. And in this slide, you'll see again, the den site is close to tree line on a north facing slope um, and on, on a bit of a flatter, rockier terrain in that, in that, um, on that slope. And you might recognize these as also areas where you would probably like to ski or sled. Um, because these are north facing slopes, they, they typically have the best snow conditions. And so, you can see there is a bit of an overlap between recreation and denning for wolverine. And I'm going to let Andrea now tell you a little bit more about how to recognize these, these den sites. Thanks, Doris. So we just really like you to be aware of potential wolverine dens when you're out in the snow. Uh, wolverine moms are really sensitive to disturbance. Um, when they're denning and they'll abandon their den if um, even, even if it's a single skier um, on foot, um, they've been known to abandon their dens and move somewhere else. So we'd really just like to um, keep these places as quiet as we can. So how to identify dens? Uh, the thing to look for is track concentrations and timing. So you're looking for areas of track concentrations where a wolverine, the mom, has hung out for a long time. And the timing for wolverine denning is between mid-February and mid-May. So that's kind of, that's a good, pretty good ski season there. Um, but that's when wolverines are looking after their kits in their den and they're nursing them 
And after that, after that period, they're less vulnerable because uh, the kids are weaned and they're mobile and so they're running around. So here's a wolverine track. These are big tracks. They're the same size as a big dog or a wolf or a cougar. And, but well, the wolverine are actually quite a bit smaller than wolves and cougars. And so you can imagine that these tracks are like snow, or their feet are like snowshoes. They really help the animal float on, um, on powder snow. And you'll notice that unlike uh, a wolf or a cougar, there's five toes, not four, and there's claw marks. And, and there's also a V-shaped heel pad. Um, if you occasionally find bear tracks in the winter, which also have five toes, but they have a very oval heel pad, whereas wolverine heel pads are V-shaped. Uh, usually you won't see nice tracks, so usually you'll just see like impressions in the snow. And so the track pattern is really important. And this is the typical um, three by or four by track pattern that uh, that is a wolverine sort of loping along. This is their overdrive gear. They spend a lot of time just kind of like in this slow run. And, um, and this pattern is really characteristic, really characteristic of wolverine. There's uh, occasionally a pine marten will do this for a very short distance, but um, but Wolverine do this for miles and miles and miles and miles. And so, and you can see this track pattern from a long ways away as well and recognize it. Uh, here's here's uh, a, another common track pattern. This is a two by two pattern. This is, this is second year. This is when they, you know, want to downshift and really like get the revs high because they're going to blast all the way to a summit ridge of a peak. Um, this is Mount Field in the Canadian Rockies. And you can see, uh, the track, they're high marking. They just blast straight up the ridge. And um, I was on skis here, and I know I did a whole pile of switchbacks between this point and the top. So they're really amazing animals and really amazing athletes. Um, this this uh, shot shows a transition from a two by pattern to a three by pattern where the animals crested a little rise and is now running downhill. So they shift back into overdrive and go into the lope and, and take off. And seeing one track on the landscape is amazing. And it's usually all that you see because Wolverine travel huge distances in the run of a day. Um, what we're looking for for dense sites is concentrations of tracks where wolverine have stayed in one place for an extended period. And so that's what this looks like here. And this actually isn't a reproductive den, this hole here. This is a, a food cache. And you can tell food caches from reproductive dens because there's usually poop or gore or bones or blood um, sort of scattered around the entrance to it. And um, whereas the reproductive dens are very tidy and clean because the female doesn't want um, other predators to notice that there um, might be uh, vulnerable kits in the den. Here's a picture of a wolverine den. This is taken from a drone and it's the toe of a, a slide path. You can see some avalanche debris there um, in the lower part of the picture. And the sort of frowny faces are rocks with snow on top of them. Big, big rocks with snow on top of them. And in the blue are, it, we've outlined uh, the tracks going in and out of a den. And so this was a reproductive den. And a helicopter pilot actually was the first one to notice this one. So if you see track concentrations, and here's another slide with some track concentrations in it, we'd really, really like you to please leave the area and ski or ride in different drainage and let the mom have her space because she is vulnerable to disturbance. But before you go, take a photo, um, a close up with a glove for scale and then far away for the pattern. And if you could submit it to wolverinewatch.org, that, that would enable us to go in there with a the drone and fly remotely and check it out and see if it really is a wolverine den. 
Um, and the timing for denning is mid-February to mid-May, as I said before. So Wolverine moms are sensitive to dis disturbance at dens and Wolverine den sites are reused. So dens are important habitat to, remain, to maintain if we want to share wilderness with Wolverine. So if you see lots of tracks, please ski or ride in different drainage. And you can see there's, there's Wolverine tracks along beside the sleds there. And please submit your observations if you see a Wolverine or a single Wolverine track or a cluster of Wolverine tracks to wolverinewatch.org. Information from people like you have been critical to the success of our research and, and critical to enabling us to find dance. And so we really appreciate um, the community of recreationists out there on the ground, uh, covering lots of ground that as a single person, uh, we, we, re we really can't cover. So thanks. Uh, Wolverines make any trips into the mountains better. And here's some of the funders that have contributed to Doris and I's research. Thank you. We're going to shift a little bit now to another um, incredible species on our landscape that maybe some people know a little bit uh, more about already. But uh, we've got Erin here who has a lot of expertise in caribou. So uh, Aaron Reed is here with us and he, uh, Aaron was born and raised in the West Kootenai. He studied at Selkirk College in the Recreation, Fish and Wildlife program and then completed his degree in wildlife management at UNBC. And he's also spent many years as a student biologist in the Columbia Basin with the Fish and Wildlife Compensation program. He has been working for the province as a wildlife biologist uh, since 2008 in the Okanagan Kootenays. And Aaron has done research and focused on sheep, goats, cougar, bear, horned animals, canines, and fur bears. Uh, so he's got a lot of wildlife experience. And he started with the caribou program as the Kootenay biologist in uh, 2017. So welcome, Aaron. Hello. Thanks, Nadine. Can everyone hear me okay? If you can, give me some jazz hands. Yeah. All right. All right. Good. I got this headset, so I'm I'm hoping that I come through a little clear today for you. Um, yeah. So uh, I've been asked to talk about caribou. Um, I'm just gonna flip uh, on my my PowerPoint and then continue on. Um, <clears throat> give me one second. All right. Can everyone see that? Is that looking good, Nadine? Okay. I'm I'm not gonna. <clears throat> yeah, the, obviously the topic is backcountry recreation and caribou, and uh, I'll, I'll touch on some caribou 101 uh, and status and threats and things like that. But I'm not. I'm gonna. I'm gonna move swiftly through that because I want to assume a certain amount of, of knowledge in the group, um, just because most of you are out there and it's 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 just hard to. Uh, it's, it's hard to not know anything about caribou and live in the Kootenays. It's a pretty hot topic. So um, and I'll touch on, of course, winter months and why they're so uh, important to caribou and the disturbance effect on caribou from our activities. Um, a couple of the protection measures that government uses to, to, to help caribou from winter disturbance. And uh, of course, what can we do as, a, as users of the backcountry? So... Um, I got, hang on a sec, I got my little timer here, there, so I don't get in trouble. Uh, here we go. So, um, British Columbia has woodland caribou. There's only one kind of woodland caribou, but there's three different kind of behaviors of these caribou that break them up into northern mountain caribou, boreal caribou, and the ones in the purple here on the map are, are of course, our deep snow mountain caribou, the ones that we all know. Uh, they're, they're Federally designated as threatened and for provincially red listed, they're they're not, they're in a lot of trouble as far as species uh, at risk go in, in Canada and and BC. So, um, this map here is actually just a, a, a core range map of of the herds in the, in the, the mountain caribou area. Uh, so all the all the red 
um, burgundy, whatever color you want to call that, is, uh, is is mountain caribou habitat. The uh, at one point in time they were from the highlands, the Okanagan, all the way to the Rocky Mountains, all the way down south to about mid uh, central Idaho and Montana. So we've we've seen a lot of range contraction over the last hundred years. Um, but what makes these animals different is uh, they're they're globally unique because of the behavior. Uh, they utilize high elevation in the winters. So they stand on top of snow and they they eat arboreal lichens, tree lichens. That's their that's their thing. Uh, the, their cousins in the north, they crater and dig for lichen on the ground. They're ground lichen eaters primarily. So, you know, they these folks would be digging a long time to get to the ground lichen in, in our mountains, as you know. I, I, you know, for sometimes two to four meter snowpacks. It's just, it's uh, it's amazing what they do. So that's, that's what makes them kind of special and unique. Most people probably know that, but, um, and again, they're in the deer family. They're medium size. They're, they're, you know, they're a fairly big animal, 1.2 meters at the shoulder, but they're, they're relatively small compared to say a moose, which would be like three times the size of, of a caribou, but the caribou have bigger feet, right? So uh, we'll get to that, but you know, beautiful, chocolate coats like when i saw my first caribou close up i was stunned by how different they look than everything else i've worked with right so um both males and females have antlers that the males usually drop them in or quite early in december and the, and the females keep them right through till till march april so but they both have antlers that makes them a little different than most um and then these feet these feet are really their 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 secret right those huge dew claws in the back they they really flare out and they and they make a big fat track in the snow and then they don't penetrate deep into the snow like like moose when you see on the logging road when you're when you're traveling uh whether on skis or sleds or whatever you see them they're post holing deep deep down in well the caribou don't do that they they walk right up on top it's quite amazing um okay so you know what that what are the problem what's the problem here that you <laughs> like anything it's it's very complex uh and it's not there's no silver bullets there's no one action it's uh it's a it's multiple things happening every herd has different problems um but they commonly it's uh increased predation habitat loss and fragmentation and winter disturbance so the first two are um are quite related uh, you know, we live in a rainforest here and in where these where these caribou are. So when you remove trees, you create light hits forest floor and you have what's called early cereal conditions where there's more forage available than there normally would be. Um, you know, forest fires do that. But uh, in our area, mostly it's, it's, it's logging, transmission lines, um, you know, even loss of habitat from, from um, reservoirs and things like that. So over the decades, we've done a good job at removing forest in, in this interior for, uh, wet belt. And, and that has created, uh, we've changed the landscape. We have now, we now have moose, we now have deer, we now have elk, or white-tailed deer, I should say. Mule deer have been around for quite a while, but, but the, these recent colonizers of, of other ungulates, primary prey, um, comes, they have taken advantage of these new openings. And then with higher densities of those animals, comes higher densities of predators, cougars, wolves. Therefore, you have more encounters with caribou who don't have the same tools to, to uh, defend themselves or, or get away from, from predators like say white-tailed deer, right? So they didn't quite evolve to the same um, level of that predator-prey relationship. But anyway, we have more encounters and the caribou are, there's too high uh, rates of mortality on both calves and adult adults. So that's driving these populations down. Winter disturbance is, is a, a big one too. We'll touch on that. That's the reason why we're here today. But this little schematic here kind of shows part of the problem. We, sh we show that to people to help illustrate the issue. And of course, this, this sled um, traffic in amongst the subalpine crumb holtzes in the top is a pretty common sight in, in some of our areas. So in the Kootenays, we were down to two herds now. We have a Columbia North up in the in north of Revelstoke. Um, that's a big circle I got there, the green. Uh, that, that actually is several herds. Um, there's groundhog in there as well, but it's mostly Columbia North. And then the south near Nacusp, uh, Lardo Duncan is the central Selkirks is the other green circle. And the, all the rest in red have been extirpated in the last 15 to 20 years, um, some very recently. 
So I'm not going to go through a bunch of numbers, but these two graphs kind of tell a little bit of a story. So the central Selkirks and the Columbia North both experienced most of their population declines in the late 90s, early 2000s. Again, primarily because of, uh, of unsustainable rates of predation on adults and calves and due to all those factors that we talked about just a few moments ago. Um, Columbia North, you can see, has stabilized over time. Uh, that, ha that dashed line is, is when we started doing things like moose reduction through hunting, trying to bring down the primary prey and reduce the, the amount of wolves on the landscape. And that's stabilized. And in recent years, other tools like maternity pens and predator control have been implemented as well, which we are now seeing growth in that population. So some good news. Um, Central Selkirks, same period, same declines, a little bit more dramatic, and then a steady decline for the last decade. That's these are the stories of most mountain population, mountain caribou populations in, in BC. Very similar trends throughout. So um, we're we want to talk about winter. So this is really the key point here is that caribou, they only have one thing to eat all winter. And that's it's lichen, it's tree lichen. And and it sucks. Like <laughs> it's not that good. It, there's only 3% crude protein in it. And that is not enough to keep them going. So they are in a negative energy budget all winter long. They have to be in good shape coming into fall so that the, the cows can, can can go through gestation and give birth to a, a heavy, healthy calf. That's the key. That's the goal. That's that's it. There's no other goal out there. I'm not making friends. And it's just it's all about having a calf. And eating lichen alone has been good for centuries. But if you have to take extra steps in your day, you're burning even more of your reserve, and your chances of having a heavy calf are let, reduced every single time you move unnecessarily. I don't have to say anything more. I, like that is so. That is a, like is, is such a simple thing, right? So. That's the key here, but we'll, we'll dive into it a little bit more. Here's a, a graph of, of a, a Columbia North, a Revelstoke caribou's um, elevational changes throughout the year. So you can see here, you know, they spend from late winter through January all the way until about mid-April up high in the, in the subalpine. Um, we survey them at 2000 meters. That's where, but that's our flight line. We don't deviate off that. That's where they are. They dive down into the spring to take advantage of the green up in, in that Revelstoke area, quite low, right down to the, uh, re the reservoir. And then they, then they bounce right back up to Cav and they spend all summer up high in the mountains. And then just before winter sets, they, they head back down because they don't like that post hole through the snow, who would? So they wait till the snow consolidates and then they bounce back up again. So that that's kind of, um, to illustrate what, why, that, or where they go, and how long they stay there. So, in the last couple of years, we've had a lot of uh, GPS collar data from our caribou, the remaining caribou in this region, and we can we can look at things like movement analysis. So, when you have a collar fixing every day, you can look at um, you can we can ask questions like, well, how much do they move in the day, and and from this graph as a as a histogram you can see that the vast majority of the movements are under 500 meters in a, in a 24 hour period. So, you know, they're milling around in that 500 meters they, or, or throughout the day, but they don't go much more than 500 meters. They make some larger movements from in, on occasion, more so in, in, in November uh, on their way to different wintering areas, but they don't move much because they can't afford to. That data is from the central Selkirks, but it's also very, very similar in Revelstoke. And it makes sense, why? So here is what a mountain caribou scene looks like from the air. Um, many people in this group have probably seen this. Uh, we have, it's a great example because we got old beds, we got old tracks. They look like the divots and the dimples in the snow, fresh tracks, fresh beds, perfect habitat. This is exactly where I'd expect to see mountain caribou. Now, these, this was a quiet place 100 years ago. You had wolverines run through, which probably scared the crap out of them, but they were used to them. They were there. They're supposed to be there, right? Porcupines, they're, they're no threat, right? They're just making a trench from A to B, from tree to tree, and the odd, the odd bunny, the odd martin. 
right? It was quiet. And then we came along and we figured out this is a good place to be too, right? So things changed dramatically over the last 30 years. I would think that the first um, users were ski tours and then heli ski companies. Um, we're really looking for the same things, right? We're looking for the same snow. We're looking for the same, it's, it's that right elevation where the temperatures are always right. I don't need to explain to this group why we, we I even like, I like to go here. There's a great shot of some skiers coming through. Um, you'd have to look close. I don't know, I think the caribou came after, but uh, anyway. Here's another another typical scene that we see. We have got a group of caribou in the middle here, and and of course some some sled tracks on the hillside. Now, I mean, this is where you want to go sledding. It's like fantastic, right? And and when the mountain machine um, came along, I think it was in the late '90s, early 2000. Um, you know, this this became a reality for us, and and we love it. People love it. It's very very popular. So. It's a, it's, it's an amazing challenge to try and figure out a balance on how to keep these animals here and, and while we can use them at the same time, right? So this is a perfect situation, right? They can cover a lot of ground sleds and so can caribou too, but... Um, the predator question came up earlier about uh, sled tracks facilitating movement for predators. Yes, they can move three times more efficient on a, on a road or a, or a seismic line or a, a sled track. But I'm not totally convinced that it's a big problem in our in our mountains. The topography is really steep. We get so much snow and wolves can go pretty much anywhere they want anyway. They're not as good as a wolverine, but they're pretty good. So we can talk a little bit more of that later, but yes, it, it, it can be an issue in, in some circumstances. But the real problem that we have to we have to kind of figure out how to how to fix is uh, the disturbance from just us in general. So there's there is really there's two types of disturbance. This behavioral response, that's the one that, that most people understand. It's pretty intuitive. Um, it's uh, you know it's just by us being there. If we roll into a drainage or into a basin and the caribou there, and um, and we're on sled say or and uh, they're going to hear us, and they're going to stand up, and they're going to move over the next ridge, and and have, and they're probably going to go somewhere else because they they can't tolerate that 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 level of disturbance unless they're under a, a high degree of habituation, which is a different story, and it's not still not good, but it's a different story, and it comes at a cost. So, increased movement and vigilance, uh, reduced foraging and resting, right? They're on edge, and then of course increased energy expenditure and avoidance, which eventually could lead to displacement or uh, from preferred ranges. They want to be there, but they can't because there's other people there. It's pretty easy to understand. Um, Dale Sipe wrote a good paper in 2007 on that one. It's hard to find good literature on this topic, but that's a, that's a good one. Um, physiological response is the one that's tougher for people to digest or believe or but it's it's just as important. It's it's the stress uh, response, um, the fight or flight. It's there for a reason. It's it's it serves a purpose. It allows caribou to get out of the way if there's danger. Right? It's it's immediate. It's, it changes the way the body takes energy. For, it allows access to the reserves right now, and it can last for hours or it can last and then even days after the event. If you can measure a stress response days after an event. Um, problem, it's so fine when it happens once a month, but when it becomes chronic, that's when we see problems or we suspect and we believe that we see problems in, in wildlife in general, not and, and particularly caribou. Chronic stress, you can read my list here, prolonged or repeated response can decrease caribou's individual fitness, right? So it's an individual problem can lead to suppression of appetite, poor body condition, hypertension. Sounds like you're reading uh, um, one, of our, one of our drug warning labels. But um, the key one here is reduced re reproductive output. So when, when you're trying to grow caribou herds and you can't, and you have chronic low calf recruitment, it's a problem. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real big problem for that, for that caribou. And it's because they're, they, it's, 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 it's happening over and over and over. And because it takes days for that response to leave 
And habituation doesn't change it. Habituated animals still have a stress response, even though they may not show a behavioral response. They may not look like they're disturbed, but this is still happening in their bodies and we know this. So that's, that's, that's the problem with the physiological disturbance from, from us being there. Um, so what tools do we have to do about it? Everyone knows about snowmobile closures, right? It affects ski tours, it affects sledders. Um, we've got a whack of them in the province. We have a whole bunch in the south here that uh, we can talk a little bit about later because they're under some different circumstances now. Um, a whole pile in Revelstoke up in the north of the Columbia Valley, right up into the Wells Gray area. And then this purple blob here is from a different slideshow, but that's the Central Selkirk's uh, range polygon. And there, there used to be a couple small closures in there. But we changed that last year because we, we felt that there was, there was a few problems there and we needed to strengthen our measures. Um, and I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious why, right? Like there's, there's not much for snowmobile management in that area. So um, we went into a process with, with the local users and we, we had a lot of discussions and it was pretty clear they wanted something a little different. Um, we have a lot of information on this herd from collared animals. So we used, uh, we, we closed a vast area with the wildlife act. And then we, we gave exemption to the users, the, the, the clubs and their members to, um, to go inside, but there were certain conditions. They had to go to a daily web map that was changed by the, the caribou locations daily. And it came with a whole bunch of different um, rules and things like that we're not gonna get into now, but it allowed flexibility for, um, well, first of all, it protected where the caribou cows are. And we have over 75% of the cows in this population collared. So it works because they're all in about three or four groups. So we're pretty confident that, that the collars are protecting them at this time. Um, but so as the caribou move, the closures move with them and it gives a little more flexibility to the users say early season, things are gonna be closed differently than they are in late season. So that's why it's kind of a win-win um, that we're trying to build off of. And so far it looks promising. But the important thing is, is context. You couldn't do this in Revelstoke with 160 animals when you only have 20 collars out. Because you can't assume that you're, you're going to displace the, the, the protection from the collared animals to uncollared animals. So it's all about context. This works here. I wouldn't do it anywhere else. We looked at, this is kind of an example of, of the zones that we use watersheds and we use riding areas and we use access routes and we use caribou telemetry data and we use um, kernel density estimates of habitat selection, everything we pumped into this thing, trying to make it make sense. Um, if you want to look at it, you can go to snowmobilecellcurts.ca uh, and check out the daily map. It's, access, it's open to everyone right now and, and read a little more if you like. It's, it's, it's working fairly well. But that, this is an example of what we, what the things we have to do now with popularity of, of the backcountry um, and, and the users and, and trying to make that balance, right? There's trade-offs for sure, but everyone has to make them. Um, on, on, the, on the other side of things, the, the more commercial side of things, this map, um, the, the orange color are, are tenures, right? So either guide tenures, heli guide and cat skiing, there's even snowmobile tenures in this map, I don't know how big or significant they would be. But point is, is that, you know, there's a lot of activity out there and this is just commercial stuff, right? So uh, we're kind of everywhere in there and on the outside of that. So it, it's, it's, it's busy. There's a lot of challenges. The last slide here, um, in context, like we're, we're starting to try and use um, as much information as we can to, to solve these problems on how to work keep caribou safe, but also allow people to, to do what they want to do. So we used our, um, for, in this example, the tenure holder, the, the heli ski tenure holder that overlaps with caribou in the, in the cusp and, and Lardo area is uh, CMH. Um, CMH volunteered to, to use the same system we were using with snowmobilers, but we used buffers to protect the collared caribou in this area uh, from encounters by helicopter. So we looked at our step rates, and we calculated uh, an encounter probability based on um, a certain distances. 
because we don't know where that animal is going to be in 24 hours uh, after the point is taken. But we can predict based on this curve here that at 1500 meters, there's a 92% probability that the caribou is going to be within 1500 meters of where they were the day before. So if you create a four kilometer diameter buffer with a little bit of extra, we're going to prevent a helicopter from flying over top of them when they're in the trees and the, and the helicopter can't see them. And so to take it a step farther, CMH built this straight into their daily run closures and it's automatically populated at three o'clock in the morning every night. And so it's just right in there with the avalanche forecast uh, closures and, and the run closures in the daily meeting. So it, it's great. It's, uh, it works, I think. It doesn't deal with disturbance, but it deals with part of it, which is encounters, which is still a disturbance, but it, you know, it, it's a good step. Um, yeah, what, <laughs> what, can, what can we do? Uh, the posters that Nadine has created, uh, I'm sure you saw with your invites, you know, there's, there's several bullets in there about how to, what to do with caribou. Um, I think that I didn't put any bullets on this, on this slide because I think a lot of it is, is fairly common sense, but you know, you, you do need to know, be aware of, of the closures that are, that exist and the details that are around them because they're getting more complicated now. Um, as time goes on, um, you got to be aware of your sign, right? If you see tracks at 1800 meters in the middle of winter, there's nothing else that can be except a caribou. Like if it's, if it's ungulate tracks in the snow, nothing. Uh, every once in a while you get a, a moose or something that's up there, but it's just, usually it's caribou. And if you see goat tracks at that elevation, they're up there, but then you're in trouble because you're on the side of a cliff. Right, they 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 don't they don't go in the same areas, right? So, um, turn around if it's fresh. Turn around and go somewhere else. That's that's what I would say to do. Uh, the, the our activities, whether it be solo on or, or a small group on skins traveling through the woods, or on a sled, um, they impact caribou. Yeah, one's probably worse than others, but they still have an impact. And there's so few of them these days that we need to give them every break we can. Um, you know, the, the, all the other things, stop your sled, take a picture, report the caribou, those are all great things too. Um, but I think the most important thing to do is uh, if you do come into a, an area with fresh sign, just go somewhere else. There's a lot of other places to go. And it's, and it's particularly because there's so few caribou, right? So um, we can talk about that more, but that's what my advice would be right now. And that's the end of that.